Okay, this is standard 4.3, respiratory system. Um, in this standard, we are going to be taking a look at how the respiratory system provides our body with oxygen and how it gets rid of carbon dioxide. So you'll be able to describe the functional units of the respiratory system, and you'll explain how the oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged at the cellular level, and this is mainly by a process called diffusion, which we've learned about before. Okay, so we're basically going to kind of go through the pathway of um, the different parts of the respiratory system um, and look what happens to the air as it moves along. So your, major, uh, your respiratory system has two major jobs. When you think about it, um, one is to get the oxygen into the body. Okay, So remember that our cells need oxygen in order to do cellular respiration. With oxygen, they can make 36 ATP. Without it, they only can make two from one glucose. So we have to get the oxygen in. But also during that process of cellular respiration, we end up making carbon dioxide as a waste, and that carbon dioxide has to be removed from the body. So if too much carbon dioxide builds up in your blood, it makes the blood acidic, and that actually can lead to um, cells being destroyed in your body. So we're getting carbon dioxide out and oxygen in. Okay, so the term respiration is actually three different functions. So when we hear the word respiration, a lot of times we think cellular respiration, well cells are using gases in their own way. Respiration as a whole is how we get those gases in and out of the body and then how the cells are going to use them. So there's three parts to it. The ventilation piece is the actual breathing. So we have to be able to breathe in the air and breathe out the air. So that's one main component to how respiration works. There is the actual gas exchange that occurs in two different places. Um, the first place is in the lungs, and that is between the air that we breathe in and our blood that is surrounding the parts of our lungs. And then we also have a gas exchange that happens um, between our blood and the tissues of our body so that our cells get the oxygen that they need and they can get rid of the carbon dioxide that they don't need. And then the third part is actually using the oxygen that we are breathing in, and that is done through the process of cellular respiration. And remember, with oxygen, when we do cellular respiration, we can make 36 ATP, whereas without it, we only can make 2 ATP, um, and that's not nearly enough. So that's why we have to have a working respiratory system to get that oxygen into our bodies. All right, so there's lots of different parts of the respiratory system that we're going to be talking about. So you have the nasal cavity, that's your nose, your trachea is your windpipe. The epiglottis is what keeps you from um, choking when you breathe in and swallow. Your larynx is your voice box. And then you have two lungs. And then there's bronchi that branch off into those two lungs. And then those branch off into smaller things called bronchioles. And then the bronchioles actually end in little air sacs called alveoli. Um, and then you have a muscle that's also associated with the respiratory system called the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is actually what's going to contract when you take a breath in. So as we take a breath in, our air is going to basically go through each of these different structures. Um, it does not go through the diaphragm, though. The diaphragm is what's going to actually pull the air into our body. So we're just going to take a look at each of these parts in turn and see what happens to the air as it passes through each part. Okay, so here's just a simple diagram of this, and you can see your larynx is up here at the top of your trachea. Your bronchi branch off into your two separate lungs. Bronchioles are these smaller little branches, and then they end at these little air sacs. The diaphragm is this flat muscle all along the bottom um, that is not um, a place where air actually goes through. Okay, so there's your whole little diaphragm. All right, so we're going to start at the nose. So when air is breathed in through the nasal cavity, three things happen to that air, and these three things are going to help it to be processed by the body um, even better. First, the air is filtered. If you think about the amount of dust and, and debris that's actually in the air that we're breathing in, we have hairs on the inside of our nose that are going to filter out a lot of that debris. We also have mucus inside of our nose. If you ever work construction or work in an area where there's a lot of dust, your mucus actually, when you blow your nose later, you can actually see that it's dirty because it's got a lot of dust trapped in it. So filtering that air before it gets into our lungs is an important aspect because we don't want our alveoli, the little air sacs in there, to get filled up with debris. Um, secondly, your air, the air is warmed by the blood vessels that are in the lining of your nose. Um, warmed air 
um, the molecules that are warmer move faster, and so the process of gas exchange can actually happen faster when you have warmer air. Also, really cold air can damage lung tissue, so it needs to be warmed up to a degree. That's why it's better to breathe through your nose. If you breathe through your mouth outside when it's really cold, you can actually kind of feel that cold in your chest, and you have less of that happening when you breathe through your nose. Um, and finally, the air gets moistened um, by the water vapor that is associated with the mucus inside of your nose. Um, and again, moistened air is going to go through the process of gas exchange and diffusion easier than if it's not. And that's kind of the whole point. So these three things are going to happen um, as the air travels through your nasal cavities. All right, from your nasal cavities, your um, air is going to pass down your pharynx. Remember, your pharynx is your throat. Um, and then it's going to go do down into a tube called the trachea. Your trachea is commonly known as your windpipe. Um, this is actually made up of rings of cartilage. You can feel it. So if you remember, um, cartilage is a more flexible type of um, bone structure. And that allows us to be able to move our neck around. If it was just solid bone, we wouldn't be able to move our neck around very much. So that's not really a good thing. Um, the trachea is protected by a flap of skin called the epiglottis. Okay, and the epiglottis is going to actually kind of act like a lid, and it covers over the top of the trachea whenever you swallow. So if your trachea is here, you have this little flap of skin. So when you're breathing, the air can go directly down and in. When you eat, that flap of skin closes, and it shuts off the trachea, um, and then food can't get down there, and the food is forced to go down your esophagus, which is right behind your trachea. So it's an important little aspect there. So if you've ever choked on anything, that means your epiglottis got stuck open and some food or water got down your trachea. Um, and that often happens if you're eating and talking or laughing, things like that at the same time. All right, right at the top of your trachea is a um, plates of cartilage that are called your Adam's apple. This is actually your larynx or your voice box. Um, so your larynx is filled with these elastic fibers on the inside and the length of those fibers and the amount that they vibrate are going to produce the sounds that you make with your voice. So your larynx is your voice box. So it's right at the top of the trachea is your voice box. Okay. Um, you actually can feel your Adam's apple. Everybody has one. Usually in men it's larger. Okay, and the reason it's larger is their voices are deeper. So the bigger your voice box, the deeper your voice is going to be. Um, but if you put your hands in the front of your throat and swallow, you can actually feel your Adam's apple, your larynx, move up and down. Um, and we all have that. But again, males after puberty, it gets a lot bigger, and that's when their voices get deeper. Um, because the bigger the voice box is, the longer the cords are, the deeper the sound you make. All right, so once we get the air traveling down into the windpipe, then we have to get the air into our lungs. So at the bottom of the trachea, we have two branches called bronchi, okay? And it's through those that the air is gonna pass into either lung. And then those bronchi are gonna branch off into smaller and smaller bronchioles. Um, and then at the very end of theirs, uh, the bronchioles, you have tiny air sacs called alveoli. So I always like to think of this kind of like a tree, an upside down tree. So you have the trunk of the tree, and then you might have a couple of major branches that come off the trunk of the tree. And then off the trunk of the tree, you've got lots and lots of smaller branches. So those would be the bronchioles, and they kind of branch off all over. And then at the end of those small little branches, you've got your leaves, and the leaves would be the alveoli. Um, so it's kind of like if you just took a tree and, and turned it upside down, you would have what the inside of your lungs look like. Okay. So here's another picture of that. So here's your trachea that is going to branch off into one of two bronchi. Bronchus means one. And then it branches off into smaller and smaller bronchioles. Okay. Um, so you could have up to 60,000 of these little tiny branches inside of your lungs. And then those branches are going to end at tiny structures called alveoli. These are tiny sacs of thin membranes, and they are the site of gas exchange. Um, in your lungs. So we're going to be exchanging carbon dioxide for oxygen in the lungs. We're breathing in the oxygen and we're going to breathe out the carbon dioxide. So that exchange has to happen through the alveoli, these tiny little air sacs that are in the lungs. So if you look at them, you could have um, up to 8 million of these little tiny air sacs inside each of your lungs. 
there's lots and lots of them, lots of surface area that they take up. And they are these little, they almost look like bunches of grapes. Um, but it's through here the gases can actually exchange directly through that tissue. So we'll take a closer look at how that happens. Okay. So the alveoli are in very close contact with capillaries. Remember, capillaries are our smallest of our blood vessels. Now inside the capillaries, you're going to have your red blood cells, which have hemoglobin on them. We've already learned that hemoglobin carries oxygen. Okay? So at this point, the oxygen that's coming in from the air is inside the alveoli. So you have a nice little alveoli here, and you've got oxygen on the inside of it. Right? And then your blood is all surrounding the outside here. And the red blood cells are in there, and the oxygen, this, is, this should be a two there, there we go, that oxygen is going to actually get attracted to the blood because the hemoglobin is going to attract it um, and pull it into the blood. And so that's how we're going to get the oxygen into the blood. So the oxygen gets taken in. Now at the same time, there is an exchange that happens, and carbon dioxide is going to end up leaving the alveoli and going out. Um, and that's kind of what the gas exchange is that they're talking about, and then we breathe that out. Okay, so the oxygen gets breathed into the alveoli, it's an air sac like a balloon, okay, and then it diffuses into the blood, and then the CO2 diffuses out the other way. Okay, so this is what your alveoli would look like with all of these tiny blood vessels surrounding each and every one. So remember we said there's like 8 million of these things, and then they're all surrounded by a bed of capillaries. Remember we talked about how long your blood vessels are, that they can like go to the moon and back or around the earth three and a half times or something like that. Um, that's because you've got all these tiny little blood vessels surrounding every single one of these tiny little alveoli. And it's through that the exchange is going to happen into this blood and into the alveoli, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, The way that this happens is because of diffusion. So remember in diffusion, molecules are going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So if you take a look at our alveoli, so this would be like the inside of an alveoli, so the wall is one cell thick, and then here's a capillary right next to it. So the oxygen is going to diffuse from the alveoli, which is mostly air, and into the blood because it's getting attracted to that red blood cell and there's less oxygen in the blood at that point than there is in the alveoli. Same things happens with the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is going to move out of the blood into the alveoli, again, because it's moving down its concentration gradient. There's more CO2 in the blood than in the alveoli, so the uh, carbon dioxide is going to move out so you can get rid of it. So this whole process is actually a passive process. It doesn't take any energy for the gas exchange to happen, um, and it happens purely by diffusion. Okay, So that's an important thing to remember. We have talked about that before. So molecules move from high to low concentration. So without the ability to do the diffusion, you wouldn't be able to exchange your gases. And the key to that is that the alveoli and the capillaries are each one cell thick. So those blood vessels can go right through those cell membranes. Um, or the, the molecules can move right through those cell membranes um, when they're doing this diffusion. And they're just always moving from a high to low concentration. All right, so ventilation is the mechanical process that we use to move the air in and out of our lungs. Um, the way that ventilation works is because of the contractions and relaxation of the diaphragm. So as your diaphragm is contracting, we're taking breaths in, and as it relaxes, we're taking a breath out. Um, also involved in this is the rise and fall of the rib cage. So if you notice, you take a breath in, your rib cage expands out, and that actually leaves room for your lungs to inflate. Um, and then as you take a breath out, your rib cage falls, and that leaves room, or that happens as your air is leaving your lungs because they're deflating. So the diaphragm is a muscle that is found below the lungs. It actually separates your thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity. Um, so your thoracic cavity is where your heart and lungs are, and your abdominal cavity is where your stomach and intestines. And this diaphragm is this flat muscle that separates those two cavities from each other. So when you inhale or breathe in, the diaphragm moves down, and that allows room for your lungs to expand. It also changes the air pressure in your lungs, and that makes the, um, or in your thoracic cavity, and that makes the air rush in. Um, and when you exhale, the diaphragm actually moves back up, um, and that's actually the relaxation piece. 
and that's going to push the air back out of your lungs because it's making less room and it's changing the air pressure again in your thoracic cavity so the air is getting pushed out because there's not enough space for it anymore. Okay, so in inhalation, you can see here, the diaphragm has been moved down, the rib cage is out a little bit, and remember we talked about how there's cartilage associated with the rib cage so that it can move around. That's where all this cartilage is in here, so that gives it that ability to kind of be a little more flexible. And then during an exhale, you can notice the difference. The diaphragm is much further up. The rib cage has actually come down a little bit. It's not as easy to see on this one, but there is a difference there. And this is where your lungs are deflating and the air is getting pushed out. Okay. So again, here's just another picture of all of these different parts. So you're, remember your um, air is gonna come in through your nasal cavities. It's better to breathe through your nasal cavities. And then it comes down through your pharynx to your larynx, here's your epiglottis that's gonna keep you from choking, down your trachea, and then it's going to go one into one of the two bronchi, and then branch off into all these smaller and smaller bronchioles until you end at the tiny little air sacs, and those are the alveoli. Okay, on here we're just going to take a look at the order of the organs through which the air passes. So we're going to take that oxygen-rich air in from the environment and we're going to breathe it in through our nasal cavities. From there the air is going to travel down our pharynx, remember that's also known as our throat. And then from there it goes down to our trachea, our windpipe. The trachea is going to branch off into one of two bronchi and enter the lungs. Okay, the bronchi branch off into smaller and smaller branches called bronchioles which eventually will lead to the alveoli. And that is where the um, carbon dioxide and oxygen are going to get exchanged. Okay, so we're gonna put the oxygen into the blood and the carbon dioxide is going to come out. Um, and then when we breathe out, we actually do this whole process in reverse. So from those alveoli, we go back out the bronchioles, um, then the split of the two bronchi, and then back up the trachea to the pharynx, um, and then out the nasal cavities, and then we end up breathing out the carbon dioxide rich air out into the environment. And remember, that's what the plants can then use to do their photosynthesis. So you really, if you learn one of the pathways, then the other pathway is the exact opposite. And you can kind of get both of them in that way.